Let's see if I'm loud enough. Oh. Um, okay, so um, I'm a theoretical physicist and I work on a, a variety of problems in population dynamics ranging from invasive species uh, to cytoskeleton. But today I'm going to talk about only about microbes. Uh, and of course, as you know, microbes affect all aspects of our life, uh, and they do it by working together, right? So any of the function you will hear is a product of uh, many species from 10 to 100 um, to potentially 1,000 species working together to, account to provide a particular uh, ecological function. And therefore, people have been interested for a long time to understand uh, how the microbes interact, right? Uh, you can uh, construct interaction networks based on the metabolic exchanges, based on time series data, uh, based on experiments, or you can look at cross-sectional samples and infer correlations between microbes and interpret those as interactions, right? Um, as a result of this, you typically end up with a network, which is a dump of human microbiome based on these cross-sectional correlations. And uh, you can't see the links very well, but believe me, this network looks like a nice hairball. Um, and that's a typical result you get from these studies. So the goal of my talk is very simple. I want to convince you that all of these interactions cannot be happening at the same point in space at the same time, right? And why that's the case? Well, because microbes have a finite size, right? And you can't pack uh, too many cells next to each other. So within any spatial location, only a very small subset of this network uh, uh, are going to be realized. And things are worse than that because spatial structure is not random. Um, so here is uh, an example of uh, spatial structure obtained by Gary Barisi's lab, uh, who was able to fluorescently label up to 20 uh, most abundant species in the oral microbiome. And you see that microbes form these kind of patches, and the number of interaction between different species is very small compared to what you would imagine in a low mixed population. So this spatial structure forms for a variety of reasons. It could be a product of ecological succession, um, you know, different organisms could keep attacks to, towards each other. They actually have special receptors to bind to each other. But apart from all the biological uh, really complicated reasons, uh, this structure arises just from the fact that if a blue cell divides, well, it's right next to another blue cell. And so over time, you end up with a patchy distribution where um, similar cells are next to each other. Right? Um, and so my goal is trying to understand how this uh, very simple process uh, of, uh, you know, uh, limited dispersal affects uh, microbial interaction, right? People have been studying this uh, process in a simple laboratory environments by doing the following experiment, right? You take your favorite organism and design two strains that could be interacting, but for the simple example, they're not interacting. In fact, they're identical, except they have a different fluorescent marker. You mix them together, put them in a petri dish, and then wait uh, for a week, and you have a nice colony this colony doesn't have any features because it doesn't matter whether you grew one strain or two strains, they're identical. However, if you look under fluorescent microscope, you end up with an interesting pattern, or like a pattern of sectors, where different strains uh, tend to separate from each other. Uh, and again, that's simply just the fact that you know, when blue cell divides, it's next to another blue cell, right? We can also think about it maybe more theoretically by making a connection with population genetics. Uh, and again, to do that, you can imagine looking along this arrow, which is kind of tracing the history of this expansion. I want to point out that in these experiments, most of the growth happens outside of the colony where there are, there are enough nutrients. And so in the beginning, uh, you have a mixed population. However, the expansion, as the expansion proceeds, there are fluctuations, which in population genetics are known as genetic drift. And these fluctuations eventually cause one of the genotypes uh, to go extinct and the other one to reach fixation. Um, so as a result, you end up with the formation of uh, a sector of a single color, right? Um, so these patterns uh, um, you know, uh, occur for a variety of organisms here. I just uh, showed a few examples, right? So on top, you see E. coli, which is now expanding in a different geometry instead of you know, being expanded from a droplet. There's a linear inoculation that grows up and down. There is uh, uh, our favorite lab yeast. There is pseudomonas. And these patterns have been found for S. pombi, Vestosatellus, and many other organisms. It's also very straightforward to simulate um, these dynamics. All you need to do is somehow population the lattice where you have you know, sites. Each site may have n organisms, and there's migration between sites. And in no time, you can reproduce uh, 
um, patterns like that, which you know, in simulations, which you know, very very simple simulations without any complexity, that reproduce uh, biological uh, experiments. And you can also do more complicated simulations where cells mechanically interact, they exchange nutrients. But regardless of the complexity, the robust behavior of sectoring and genetic drift is preserved. Right? Um, in addition to being able to simulate these patterns very easily, one can actually solve them entirely analytically. and One can compute almost every property one wants about these expansions. Just as an example, I'm showing you that one can calculate how the number of the sectoring domains depends on migration rate, velocity of the expansion, or size of the colony. And these predictions are in quantitative agreement with experiments and simulations. So these patterns uh, affect uh, many processes uh, in um, microbial populations because almost all evolutionary ecological processes are going to be confined to the boundaries between the different strains rather than being happening everywhere in a population. And I've spent quite some time trying to figure out how these patterns affect species competition, mutational processes, horizontal gene transfer. But today I'm going to focus um, just on microbial interactions. And I want to answer a few questions. The first couple questions that I'm going to answer in quite some detail um, talk about um, now, how spatial structure affects interaction networks, and then talk about the diffusion of metabolites uh, uh, in this colony. And then, as we have time, I'm going to address maybe some more interesting questions, which are uh, part of the unpublished work, uh, um, which is uh, how does the geometry of the habitat uh, um, affect interactions? What, are, what can we say about high order interactions that involve more than two species? Uh, and then maybe we can identify some design principles of microbial communities, and maybe even try to infer uh, interaction patterns purely from the spatial patterns of uh, microbial uh, abundances. Right? Um, OK, so let me begin uh, with the first question. Um, so, and to do that, we're going to um, begin with a very simple system, uh, cross-feeding of two strains. It's a common motif in more complex interaction networks as well as probably a key element in uh, synthetic microbial communities that we would like to design. And for that reason, probably uh, Winning Shu has introduced this system about a decade ago, uh, trying to understand uh, how simple uh, heterotrophic cooperation works. Right? Um, so here are the two species that exchange an amino acid, and they really require each other for growth. We're going to label the species A and B, because you know, we're physicists. And then we're going to denote the relative fraction population by Fs, and these fractions sum up to 1. Right? Um, to model the interaction between them, we have to define their fitness. And their fitness must depend on the abundance of the partner in the population. And in the simplest possible model, you can say that the fitness of species A is going to be some basic growth rate uh, plus uh, uh, a term that is proportional to the abundance of the partner organism, right? So the fitness of A depends on the abundance of B and vice versa. So if you define a, a fitness function like that, uh, then in a well-mixed population, you end up with the following dynamics, where every species is going to invade one rare, and they're going to stabilize at a certain fraction uh, F star, right? This fraction is given by the relative benefit um, that uh, organisms get from cross-feeding, and the rate at which they converge to this steady state is given by the strength of the interaction. Right? So, and here is a simple mathematical expression that one can obtain uh, from that evolutionary dynamics. Right? In addition to describing mutualism, uh, uh, the same model can also account for bistability and competitive exclusion. And that's pretty much the same uh, diagram that Jeff Gore was showing a couple of days ago. Uh, where you know, if both alphas are positive, you end up with mutualism. If they're negative, you have bistability. And if they have different signs, then we have uh, competitive exclusion. Right? And again, so what I'm going to try to do next, in the next five minutes, is try to tell you how this uh, diagram changes if we put this interaction in the spatial population. Right? Um, so the first step is very simple. You can just put this population in um, and sim simulate these dynamics. And for example, you can look at the spatial patterns uh, as you change the strength of uh, interaction, right? And so here, what you see is a population that was you know, initially occupying this low edge and was allowed to expand outward, right? And if you look at these pictures, you immediately see that cross-feeding can overcome uh, the spatial separation to domains, right? So the bigger the cross-feeding, the smaller the domains uh, that we see. 
However, this is not a simply quantitative effect. In fact, there's a qualitative difference between small and large uh, cross fittings. And we can see just by running simulations longer. And what you find is that if the cross fitting is too small uh, or is below some threshold, then the populations would completely phase separate. And eventually, one of the species is going to take over. While if cross fitting is uh, strong enough, then the mixing is going to, um, yeah. Uh, OK, so the dynamics of simulations, um, uh, no, we have a lattice of sites. Each site has n organisms. They can migrate between them. Um, and we do a Moran type of update, right? So one particle is always killed. One is, uh, uh, you know, is born. And the probability of birth is depends on the local fitness. And the local fitness, in this case, is computed um, according to those formulas where it's proportional to the fraction of the partner species. Right. Um, so in these guys, it's effective. Well, so I showed you both 2D. These guys are 1D, where we simulate just the growing edge of the colony, because that's where all dynamics happens. But we will get to some 2D simulations later as well. And I'll try to make clear which one is which. Um, on, on, you can also do 2D, but again, as long as you expand in one direction, it's going to have the same results. Um, OK. So I'm going to. Instead of showing a bunch of these pictures, I want to be a little bit more quantitative. Um, and I want to define a few indices that are going to characterize uh, um, you know, how these, how about characterize the spatial structure. The first index you can define is somehow a, min a mixing index, which is analogous to um, heterozygosity that we have in, the sort of in genetics, and just tells the probability to find two organisms, two different organisms at the same spatial location. Right? Um, so, in the simple model I'm talking about now, this mixing in the index actually tells you about fitness because if I know H is zero, there is no cross-feeding because species have to be present at the same location. As we move to more complicated models that, for example, include uh, uh, diffusion of metabolites, this will no longer be the case um, because you know, you know, they, even though the species are locally demixed, they could still exchange nutrients. And so it's nice to define a more general quantity which I'm going to call a community productivity. And it basically measures the fitness gain due to cross-fitting, right? So it's the your fitness minus the fitness without cross-fitting normalized by the uh, fitness you would get in a well-mixed population, right? Uh, so I have my definition of Ws, right? Uh, so you know, W0 plus alpha beta. So I can compute uh, the fitness at every spatial location using my definition of fitness. Right. So the fit, I mean, in simulations, you, you create, you define a fitness function, and you run simulations, right? So of course, you can always compute fitness in your simulations. Um, no, it's a Moran model, right? So in Moran model, there is, I mean, you, you can have more complicated models where you have, you know, carrying capacity, growth rate, competition. In this case, this is just one number because it, it affects. I mean, you can think of it as a growth rate, right? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, well, that's a, that's a probability, right? Because if, you know, uh, if, uh, for example, Fs, if, if you have 50-50 ratio, right, you only have 50% chance to take two different organisms, right? And that's why the factor of two is there. It's really, a, you know, it's, it's an exact formula. It's really the probability to get two different organisms. So this H is going to go between zero and a half. And if you didn't have a factor of two, it's going to go between zero and a quarter, which is not quite right. Yeah, so we don't have nearest neighbor. We have, we have many organisms per site. Oh. And within each site, it's one, whatever, W0 plus alpha times F of the partner. Right? Um, yeah. OK. Any other questions? Uh, OK. So again, as I said, in this very simple model, there is a very simple relationship between these two quantities. And it's just you know the productivity just proportional to the to the mixing index because its all interactions are local, right? Okay. So with this measure, I can show you pictures like this where I can quantify the community productivity as the function of the interaction strength. And as I said earlier, I have a phase transition where for strong interactions I have positive uh, community productivity, but below a certain threshold, the productivity drops uh, to zero. Uh, 
right? Uh, so this was this is the data for symmetric interactions. So we can also, of course, do asymmetric interactions. And what uh, turns out uh, is that the symmetric interactions are significantly more stable than asymmetric ones, right? So here we see the heat map of community productivity. The white regions correspond to productive cross-feeding, while the black regions uh, correspond to competitive exclusion, right? And so I also show you the well-mixed diagram here so you can compare and see that this entire region of uh, coexistence was squeezed to a much smaller region uh, shown here in white. I mean, for the physicists in the audience, of course, we see this picture with slightly different eyes. Um, you know, these lines over here are lines of phase transitions, and these phase transitions can be classified in a relatively small number of universality classes, right? Uh, in this case, uh, most of them belong to the so-called directed percolation transitions, but this very special point is a different universality class called DP2, and the crossover be between these universality classes, of course, determines uh, the shape of this phase diagram. I know we see as I go forward that this idea of um, universality classes and phase transitions uh, can sometimes give you a, a significant insight into the dynamics of these populations. Around the same time as we were thinking about these ideas, uh, Winning Shu who was, uh, was also thinking about it together with her postdoc, uh, Babak Mameni, and they've done experiments to demonstrate uh, uh, precisely that. So they have engineered a few strains of yeast, and they indeed showed that um, uh, Cross-feeding persists only if it's sufficiently strong, and populations that you know, coexist in a well-mixed culture fail to do so uh, in spatial populations. A few years later, Melanie Miller in Andrew Murray's lab has done um, a much more you know, thorough experiment so where uh, she, varied, she basically tried to tune the degree of cross-feeding by adding amino acids to the media, right? So she can have uh, these two amino acids that the species cross-feed, and if she doesn't add them to the media, then, of course, the mutualism is obligate. However, if she adds well, enough of these amino acids, then the benefit of, of cross-feeding drops uh, to zero. And in that case, uh, uh, you have demixing, right? So and she you know, made this entire diagram. I'm going to simplify it on this picture. So basically, the summary is that in the experiments, she indeed found that there are these four regions. There's a region of coexistence. There's a region of almost neutral dynamics where there's demixing and the uh, regions of competitive exclusions. OK. So I have now addressed uh, the first question. And I want to move um, um, to the second one, which is uh, talk about public good diffusivities. Um, and the diffusion, you can think, of, you, know, you can imagine that it's going to be very important, because uh, you know, all my, you know, my main assumption was that the interactions have to be local. right? You have to have both species at the same time. But you can imagine, in a situation like this, if the, if the nutrients can diffuse across the boundaries, then the species do not have to be at the same point, and they can still productively cross-feed. So we ask the following question, well, how does community productivity depend on the diffusion of metabolites? OK. So I mean, again, you, now you modify the simulation. So now we don't have these dynamics. Now the species secrete public goods. Uh, they consume them, they produce them, the public goods diffuse with a different diffusion constant, and now the fitness depends not on the fraction of the partner species, but rather on the local concentration of the public goods. So if we do these simulations, we find that actually if we increase the diffusion constant, then uh, the productivity of the community goes down, and below a certain diffusivity, it drops precisely to zero which is a little bit different from what we expected. And to see why this is happening, we looked at the spatial structure. And we found that as we change the diffusivity, the communities transition from being mixed uh, to being uh, demixed. All right. um, moreover, uh, the demixing, so the length scale of the domains, uh, grows much faster than the length over which nutrients can be exchanged. So even though as you increase the diffusion constant, you transport nutrients further along, but this process cannot uh, catch up with the growth of the domain, uh, domain length. Right? Uh, to understand why uh, this is happening, again, it's sufficient to look what happens at the main boundary. And this is probably one of the most complicated figures in this talk, so I'll let me try to walk through it slowly. So here, these thin lines, they show you the concentration of the species. Right? So here it has species A, here has species B, and this is a transition zone. Uh, the thicker lines show you the concentration of the nutrients or the public goods they exchange, 
And these lines are smoother because uh, of the diffusion constant that smooths the variation. Now, the differences in a public good concentration tells you the local strength of selection for coexistence. Um, and as you can see here, it's pretty high away from the boundary, but right at the boundary, you have both uh, nutrients present, and uh, the selection for coexistence is actually zero. Um, and, uh, you know, now you can see that because natural selection can only operate when both species are present, it is confined to this very narrow region of the species boundary where the selection is small. And one can actually estimate how small it is by a very simple argument. The selection coefficient here is going to be given by a selection coefficient outside times the ratio of the boundary uh, width to the length scale which the nutrient diffuses. So, um, this is a very simple argument, tells you that diffusion does not really have any you know, new fundamental role in the system. It simply renormalizes the selection coefficient and makes it smaller. Right? And this is not a hand wavy argument. We can use it, for example, to compute how the critical diffusivity when the productivity collapses depends on the migration rate, population size, and selection, and indeed observe the same exponents uh, in simulations. We can also now use the fact uh, that uh, the diffusion does not change the phase transition uh, in the system um, and immediately argue that for any phase transition, we will expect that um, as we approach the critical point, the length scale, in this case the main length scale, has to diverge uh, with some exponent given by the universality class of the phase transition. And this is indeed the behavior that we see, right? As we approach the critical diffusivity, we see that the, the main length diverges. And again, this is something you would not probably guess without the theory of phase transitions. And indeed, people have been trying to use other approaches like dimensional analysis and naive scaling and predicted that, for example, the main uh, length is going to go as d to some power, which is, of course, inconsistent uh, well, with this picture. Um, OK. So I want to maybe, uh, maybe mention one last thing about the public good diffusion, right? So I've told you that. Fusion does not going to rescue mutualism. It's actually going to make things worse. But then uh, we were very inspired by this paper that looked at uh, other public goods, in this case, siderophores among different organisms. And what they found is that even though all siderophores have a very simple function of side given by this pair of OH groups, they have an amazingly diverse set of shapes. And uh, they were able to compute the diffusion constants for these different shapes. And again, they have similar molecular weight, but they have very different stickiness to the environment, which affects the diffusion constant. And they found that diffusion constants can vary by orders of magnitude uh, between different microbes. So I'm gonna, not going to show any data from our work, but we explored um, the effect of you know, the, whether a species can get a benefit by changing its diffusion constant. And we found that diffusion constants are under very strong selection. However, there is no simple answer like, I want to have a very high diffusion constant and I have a very low diffusion constant. Because the answer depends on the nonlinearities of the dynamics. In particular, whether you have uh, diminishing returns from the public goods or you have somehow accelerating returns and other nonlinearities in production and consumption, you may want to choose different diffusion constant, either faster or slower than your partner. And so as, the, as, as a result of these dynamics, it's quite possible that uh, uh, the diverse chemical shapes could be indeed optimal uh, for, a given, uh, for a given ecological dynamics. Okay, so by now I've answered the first two questions, at least to some extent, right? I've told you about um, uh, the role of spatial structure and that it can, for example, remove some interactions uh, in, the, uh, in the microbial, uh, in the, in the, basically it can remove cross-feeding. So you might think that you have this interaction, but if you put things in space, the interactions don't exist. Um, in a few slides, I'm going to tell you that spatial structure can also create new interactions. Um, and I uh, basically told you that a diffusion is not a fundamentally new thing. It it's basically just renormalizes uh, the parameters in the model. So now I'm going to move on to uh, some, maybe some more interesting questions uh, um, about the geometry and the uh, high number of species, right? Uh, so the simplest of these questions is the question of geometry and dimensionality, because in physics we understand it quite a bit. And the general answer is that the higher number of dimensions you have, the more uh, dynamic, the more similar the dynamics is to a well-mixed population. So why do we have different dimensionalities? 
Well, so let's uh, think about the growth in a colony where you grow only at the very edge, and that's effectively a one-dimensional population growth. Or you can think about growth on top of a biofilm, in which case the dynamics is a quasi two-dimensional. Right? Uh, and in many cases, uh, uh, the difference between one and two dimensions is just quantitative. Uh, but there are a few examples where one really gets very different qualitative behavior. One of them is this uh, symmetric mutualism. So in one dimension, as I showed you earlier, there is this phase transition where below critical strengths of um, cross-fitting, uh, the cross-fitting is completely lost. This doesn't happen in two dimensions. In two dimensions, if you tune the cross-fitting arbitrarily small, uh, the species maintain their coexistence. However, this is a fragile point, and if you introduce any asymmetry between the cross-fitting, then you recover uh, the phase transition. Right? Uh, now, the more challenging question uh, than spatial structure is the idea of a um, uh, high number of species. Right? Um, and uh, you know, I have this network for the human microbiome, but I actually have no idea how I'm going to model it. And if I'm going to if I ask simple questions, well, how does the genetic drift affect these interactions? I don't know how to answer it because, I mean, you can, I can put some kind of random matrices that Pankaj did um, um, you know, on Wednesday, but um, I never know whether the properties I see are from the specific assumptions they put into the model or from the topology of the interaction network. I don't think we have a very satisfactory answer to how to proceed, but we came up with, I mean, at least maybe a step forward, what we call a topological model. Right, so let me give you uh, a basic idea. So we have some habitat, right? And this habitat, you're going to have different species and different number of species in different locations. So for example, this location has only two species. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to simulate the dynamics of just these two. And say for blue and uh, red, there is no interaction, so I'm going to evolve them neutrally. Now, in a different patch, I have three species. So now I'm going to evolve them according to the dynamics for these three species, right? And I'm going to say that there are two, I mean, I'm going to basically evolve them according to a well-mixed prediction. So if, for example, these guys are strongly mutualistic, um, then I'm going to evolve them towards, say, an equilibrium and equal fractions. And I'm going to do it with some probability. I was going to capture the strengths of the interaction. So in this case, uh, I'm going to set them to be one-third, one-third, one-third with probability S. And with one minus that, I'm going to evolve them under neutral dynamics, so binomial sampling, right? So again, this model is not perfect, but it allows us to uh, quantify the strengths of an interaction relative to genetic drift. Um, you know, these uh, models give you very similar results if you compare them to mechanistic models, right? So here again, my plot of one and two dimensions. Uh, um, I mean, the actual numbers you see here are very different, but like the type, the type of the phase transition is exactly the same. It, it happens in 1D, but doesn't happen in 2D. So the models, I mean, they're not exactly the same, but I think they capture the core, the core aspects of the dynamics. OK. So now with these models, I can ask some interesting questions. So the first question I'm going to ask, well, what happens to higher order interactions? Right? Uh, and I'm going to take a specific type of higher order interaction, which is I'm going to call collective mutualism. So imagine where you have a community where all three species have to be present to accomplish a particular goal, right? So it's not a combination of some pairwise interaction. You really have to have all three. If you have only two, nothing really happens, right? Um, uh, and I can, of course, do it to four, five, and higher number of species. And when I change the number of species, I see that these are very different uh, dynamics, right? For two species, I always have coexistence. And community is always productive, no matter what the strengths of the mutualism. But as I increase the number of species, I have a, I've now I have a phase transition. Moreover, the critical strengths of the interaction increases dramatically as I increase the number of species. Right? We can understand the difference between a high number of species and two species by looking at the spatial structure. And uh, again, two species are very special because if you look at the boundaries between the species, um, they're active. And what I mean by that is that if you have a migration between red and blue, you're going to create a mixed patch. And that mixed patch is now productive because it has both species. If you look at three and more species, again, most boundaries, for example, this one, are between uh, domains of two colors. And if you have a migration across that domain, you're not going to create a patch with three species. So most boundaries are inactive. And only when three boundaries meet, for example, here, then you, 
end up creating productive domains. And that uh, changes the universality class of the phase transitions. Again, so here you see the spatial patterns as a function of the number of species and the selection. The first thing you see is that, so the black squares show that one of the species went extinct. And you see that for each number of species, you have to increase the selection by about an order of magnitude. But you can also see uh, these plots, right? So which show you how the productivity changes within um, the, the close after the phase transition. For high number of species, it uh, has the same behavior consistent with the directed percolation universality class, but it's a different behavior uh, for two species. And that, of course, reflects the fact that uh, it's, you are much more likely to have uh, two species interacting than higher number of species, right? For example, for five species, you only have coexistence almost when you deterministically every time update uh, them to be at equal fractions. Okay. Well, given that um, how the interactions tend to be unstable, uh, and, but you might somehow want design communities that have them, the next question is, can one stabilize them by adding pairwise interaction to the dynamics? Okay, and the most natural interaction you may think about is adding uh, pairwise interactions that would, uh, uh, you know, uh, help these two different species, right? So if you do that and you say you begin without any pairwise interaction, which I call them reciprocal, and just have the collective mutualism, that's the result I showed you earlier. You have this uh, critical threshold. And, and then if you start adding some pairwise interactions, you see that, uh, you know, first the threshold shifts and then it disappears. And with enough pairwise interactions, you can actually stabilize uh, collective dynamics. Now, whether this happens in nature, I don't know, but I can tell you a story. Um, so, in fact, it's very hard uh, to find a community where you have these high order interactions. And that's not surprising because we think that they're unstable. One of such communities is shown here. This is a community that has to live off butyrate without oxygen, and that's a very poor energy source. And it grows only when all three members are present because of some metabolic interactions that are involved uh, in, this, in this community. This community is so poor that its doubling time approaches a year compared to 20 minutes for E. coli. So it grows extremely slowly. So you can see the time here in days, and it goes to like 2,000 days. And then if people looked at uh, you know, the oxotrophies in this community, they found that each of the partners uh, makes a unique amino acid. For example, the first one makes these two amino acids. The second one is the only one who makes histidine and lysine. And the final partner is the, is the only organism that makes serine. So again, this is not a main way to prove, but it's, you know, uh, it is quite possible that uh, this pattern of cross-feeding might be useful for the organisms to stabilize the spatial structure in the community. OK. So I also promised you to show that spatial structure can create new interactions. And this is an example of that. Um, uh, so here I'm plotting the probability to find three species in a patch as a function of the strengths of the mutualism. So again, the, the blue one is the collective one. We have a threshold and then a higher probability. But the same dynamics also occurs in the reciprocal mutualism. And I emphasize that if I had this interaction in a well-mixed culture, I would not get that, because I only impose pairwise um, cooperation. So if I put them all three in a test tube, actually any fraction of the three, including, for example, the blue guy going extinct, would be uh, equally how likely and species would have the same fitness. So in a wellness population, you would end up with uh, one of the species goes extinct stochastically, but in a spatial structure, there is really a selection towards uh, coexistence of equal fractions. OK. So now moving on from maybe a different topology of interactions, the next thing you can ask, well, what about a cyclic interaction, which is kind of maybe the most opposite to the reciprocal interaction I showed you earlier, where species A helps B and B helps C, all right? Again, it involves few interactions to, to engineer, so it's maybe, maybe uh, more useful. Well, this interaction can also stabilize the uh, high order uh, cooper cooperation. So again, this is uh, without any uh, cyclic interaction, and this is with cyclic interaction. You see that uh, you know, even a small amount of cyclicity already removes the phase transition, and now you're stable um, throughout uh, the strengths of the mutualism. However, this is a trade off. Even though you become more stable at low values of S, you are less productive at high values of S. And this becomes even more clear if we just compare a pure cyclic interaction to a pure collective interaction. So the cyclic interaction is always stable. However, it never becomes uh, very productive. 
So to understand the, this difference, we can, of course, look, look at the spatial structure. And here is the spatial structure. And again, uh, may not be very illuminating, but I want to point out that uh, the productivity and stability come from different spatial length scales. So the productivity required that three organisms occur at the same spatial point, while stability is just a requirement that all three occur somewhere in the ecosystem. And so we can make it more quantitative by measuring the probability to find species across different length scales. So what do we expect? Well, at very large length scales, the probability to find all three species has to approach one. The length scale where that happens is known as the domain size or the correlation length. Now, the productivity is determined by the interaction length, which could be a lattice site in my simulations or the diffusion range uh, in a microbial community. And uh, so the value of the productivity depends on how steeply this function decays from one. And that decay is usually a power law where the exponent is given by the universality class of the, of the phase transition. So again, if you look for the real actual data, so here we have these plots for different types of mutualism. And we see that for the cyclic interaction, the exponent is about a factor of uh, two larger. So you, you lose productivity much more rapidly compared to, to other topologies. I also want to point out that you know, this plot is done um, with just a few, I mean, 200 by 200 uh, uh, you know, lattice sites. So you don't have to have a lot of data to infer uh, that you have different types of interactions among these communities. And this is perhaps Spatial patterns are perhaps the only way to study interactions without perturbing the system. Because if you take them in a the lab, you never know whether the interactions are going to be different uh, from the natural environment because of the different conditions or because you didn't take all the species present in the natural habitat. So perhaps you can use these spatial patterns to at least say something about the interactions uh, present in the ecosystem. So with this, I want to summarize. Begin summarize. So I you know, began by telling you about genetic drift. Uh, I showed you that you know, it can destroy cross-fitting, that diffus diffusivity does not really help. And then I moved on to talk about high number of species, dimensionality, as well as different topologies, and how the, uh, they change the spatial structure, which in turn affects uh, productivity uh, and stability of the community. So the earlier part of this work was done a very long time ago uh, in collaboration with David Nelson, Kevin Foster, Zhao Xavier, Andrew Murray, Oscar Hauchek, and Melanie Miller. And all of the new work was done by Rajita Menon uh, in my group. Uh, and I want to conclude with a very simple, um, uh, like a single take home message, right? So when we think about a dynamic, natural dynamics or design of microbial communities, we often think that we can go from interaction to the community functions. And uh, that may very well work in the well-linked populations, but if you have spatial structure, I argue that there's an intermediate step which is conceptually very important. You have to think about whether your interactions are consistent with the spatial structure, and if you're designing some community function, you may want to first think about what kind of spatial structure would facilitate uh, that design. In particular, you may choose different topologies of the interaction depending on whether you're designing a stable or productive community, because in our case, we see that cyclic or, and reciprocal interactions achieve um, one of those two goals at the expense of the other. Uh, with this, I want to finish, uh, and I think I should still have some time for questions.